Hello everyone, welcome back. I'm Robin. I'm a filmmaker and photographer based on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And today I thought I would talk about that tiny little mess that is on my desk at the moment. These are some of my legacy lenses that I use not only for film photography, but I can also use those lenses onto modern cameras for filmmaking and photo. Let's take a look. So this will be less of a scripted video because I was going through those uh, lenses and pick which one I want to bring for an upcoming shoot and I thought it would be a good time to talk about uh, those more in a live way. Um, first I started to use uh, Nikkor lenses back in 2015 simply because I bought a used Nikon F3 from Japan and uh, it didn't come with any lenses so I went to my local store. He had an, a non-AI, non pre-AI 35 2.8 and this, uh, where is it, very I think it's the AI versions of a Nikkor 50mm f2. And nobody wanted those at the time, so they were very cheap, and um, I was able to get both for $50 Canadian, so that was a great uh, find, and that's how I started using them on the Nikon f3. But I also found out that the Nikkor lenses were actually some of the most versatile lenses out there, and um, for example, you could use those old lenses, some were like 50 years old, 60 years old, onto a modern DSLR such as the Nikon D850, because Nikon always kept the same Nikon F mounts throughout their film and DSLR and modern cameras uh, to the point where they went to the uh, to the Z mount with the mirrorless but before that it was the same mount so you could use those lenses with modern camera whereas with Canon they changed from the uh, FD mount to the EF mount when they moved to um, to like the most modern film camera and then uh, after that from the digital cameras so you couldn't adapt this old uh, cheap MD lenses for um, onto your Canon, but you could adapt the Nikkor onto the Canon, and at the time I had a 5D Mark II, and I had just sold a couple of months earlier my uh, zoom lens 24-105, because I wanted to learn more shooting with primes, so I sold the 24-105 for the 35 prime lens, the 104, and learning more about prime, you know, zooming with your feet, that kind of thing. But then suddenly I could only shoot the 35mm and nothing else, and sometimes I like to be able to get subject far out. So when I found out I could adapt those lenses with the small adapters, one of the first one I got was this, this big, it's a zoom lens, it's a Nikkor HG 200F 4.5 constant, quite compact, and one of those old pull-out, which is kind of funny. Um, and this was great because I could mount that on my 5D Mark II and suddenly I had like something to shoot a bit of maybe wildlife or far out subject. The only reason why I got those wasn't because of the look or anything like that. There wasn't really a thing back then to adapt all lenses because mirrorless were kind of new um, and you couldn't really adapt all of those old lenses. So nobody really gave a about those lenses. Um, and the reason why I got those is because it was a cheap way of getting a, a new focal lens for my, uh, for my kit. So I got this for, I believe, same for about $40 Canadian. And suddenly I had a zoom lens for my Canon, which was great. And I could also use it for my Nikon. And from them, I just like, yeah, obviously fell down the, the rabbit hole here. All of those lenses have some of like characteristics that are unique to each lens or to each uh, series of lenses. Most of those lenses are actually a very fast uh, aperture. I mean, uh, this uh, 58 has a 1.4. This, um, what's this one? Is this a millimeter? as a 28 at f2.8. This is the 28 Nikkor 2.8, uh, 35 f2. This is a 50mm by uh, for Minolta Aurora It has a 50mm 1.4, so very fast, very fast lenses. This is one of my gem. This is the 105 by Nikkor f 2.5, and then here I have the Nikkor uh, f 50mm uh, f 1.2. So this same is like as like lots of light gonna go in here, and and then it's great for low light capability, low light uh, situations. And by now, I feel like a lot of people are actually using those old legacy lenses and like seeking them out to adapt them on like mirrorless cameras because uh, now with mirrorless camera and you remove that uh, those mirrors, uh, you can basically adapt any kind of old lenses with the correct adapters on any type of mirrorless camera. Another reason why to try those legacy lenses is the size. Um, they are all prime lenses except uh, this zoom lens here, um, and they're very very small. I mean, here you have the the cap at the back, but um, Look at the size of this. This is a 28 f 2.8. So this is very small, uh, much lighter. Um, I have another one here, which is the. Oop, this one I want to go back. Yes, here I have a 35 mm f 2 from Nikkor. 
um, removing against the the back and here that's the size of it so obviously it looks thicker because of that focusing ring which i'll talk in a bit but that's look how small this is you can basically put that into a pocket compared to a modern lens here this is my uh the one i sold my 24 to 105 for and i started my prime uh, lens uh, journey with this is the ef uh, 35 mil 1.4 l it's basically uh, two of this one into this one so that's kind of a bit of a change if you're like traveling with those or backpacking with those. Um, and obviously you can only really compare them. I mean, this has uh, much more modern glasses. This is uh, as under focus. It was the L series, which was a professional line by Canon. So different type of, of, of equipment here, but it's still something to keep in mind is that um, even now the most modern lenses by uh, Canon, the, the RF mounts are huge. I mean, the, the 51.2 is an amazing lens. It's sharp at f1.2 uh, from edge to edge like i said uh, no no diffractions no fringing just a beautiful glass but it's it's it's, it's massive and it's very heavy um, so some people might not want to to backpack with this or to travel with those because suddenly if you want to have your um, full set of prime lens by canon you're gonna need a bigger bag uh, whereas those i mean you can pack like four of those for one of Prime lenses by uh, with the by Canon by the with the RF mount. Mine look may look a bit different because they have this like a uh, focusing ring around. Uh, we'll talk about that later on, but yeah. And then uh, my dad had a Minolta, and I also shooting Minolta alongside my uh, Nikon F3. So I obviously had uh, some Minolta lenses as well that are here because I can adapt them on a modern camera. Another reason to adapt those lenses um, onto modern cameras, if you're an hybrid shooter shooting both film and digital is that you could technically just pack your set of uh, prime legacy lenses to use on your film camera and your digital camera and then making your backpack lighter. <laughs> and the other reason too is that um, often uh, if you're trying to replicate the film look uh, with your digital files, um, obviously you won't be able to do it 100% uh, like the, the film because it is the way film uh, reacts to light is so much different than digital uh, sensor. But um, using those lenses will really help you uh, getting closer because often when you see an image, you're like, oh, it's a great image, which, which camera did you use, for example, um, which can make some sort of sense for digital work. But for film images, the camera doesn't matter at all because the camera is just a box with the sensor turning on and off. What matters is obviously the film stock and then the lenses because what you see is what I mean the characteristic of the images will come from the film stock and from the characteristic of each of those lenses so the way the lenses render the colors the way the lenses uh, how sharp the lenses is and so um, next time you see a uh, film images uh, ask for the lenses not the camera <laughs> and another advantage of shooting those old uh, lenses is that uh, as you can see the, the filter thread is is much smaller um, for prime lenses generally a modern fast uh, prime lenses will have a filter thread uh, 67 maybe 72 um, so this is like the bigger the filter the more expensive it is but here all of my Nikkor lenses have the same filter thread which is 52 mil which was the most popular filter thread back then it's the same as the uh, Canon FD mount and then you can get basically much cheaper to get a filter for it right and you can also get some of those, some of those older type of filter that people don't really make anymore, such as the um, the Sky Skylight 1A, for example, or uh, some fog filters, which were like a, a version of the mist filter, but much stronger. And then with the Minolta, I have believe it is a 55mm 55 55 millimeters, uh, thread, which is very unknown. And so it's a bit more difficult to find a filter for those. Um, so, but still great lenses all around. So like I said earlier, one of the reasons why people are seeking those old legacy lenses is for their unique characteristic that they want to bring over onto their modern cameras. Because more of, these days, most of the modern lenses are like perfect, very sharp from edge to edge um, and like very clinical. Uh, whereas those, they have their defaults. They won't be sharp from edge to edge, um, but they have their unique look. They render color differently depending on the brands and the series you're choosing. So all of those things can be used for creative projects, for example, for filmmaking. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why people are using them and more importantly, like uh, independent filmmakers. For anyone starting into filmmaking or uh, independent filmmakers, these legacy lenses make a great 
uh, starter uh, cine kits. So you could um, buy uh, some of those lenses to make your first uh, fast prime lenses kit. And uh, this will help you uh, really save some money compared to the most modern um, cine lenses. And uh, obviously it will be night and day between what you can do with them. Um, but it's a great way just to start out with. And uh, that's the reason why some of those lenses that I have mine have this uh, color here for the uh, focusing ring. These were made by Full Focus, so they're hard. Um, and then I, well, as it can be used uh, with a Full Focus, for example. The thing is though that uh, you won't easily, re easily remove them. So usually you have kind of like to heat them a little bit with a microwave or something just so that they can they expand a little bit and when they cool down they retract and perfectly go along the focusing ring. So I put those like uh, two years ago and I'm not going to remove them anytime soon. Despite the fact that I use those for film as well, uh, it would be great if they could be uh, slightly thinner. You get a set of those AIS, which was the latest versions of uh, Nikkor lenses before they move to the new mount. Um, and to the new, um, sorry, not the new mount, but the new uh, autofocus ones. And then you would get your uh, maybe a 24, 35, 50, 85, 100 mil, maybe 135. And all will have an aperture between uh, 1.4, uh, 2.8, which are still very, very fast lenses and very capable for filmmaking and for low light situations. And then there are a couple of uh, companies out there that will be able to rehouse those for you. So the, the cheap way, the easy way is to buy those adapters and just to like mount them and you can just quickly disassemble them if you want to use them in, onto the cameras. Um, but the, what the rehousing means is that the company will basically just take the, the glass elements and nothing else and fully rehouse it so that the, 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 the back here is the mount you desire, basically, let's say for example, EF mount. And then the front lens will also won't be a 52 uh, thread, but would be a 77 or 95, depending which one you choose. And then the rehouse will have a obviously the the ring for the for the um, for the follow focus. So and the last thing is that it will declick the aperture. My uh, aperture is not declick um, because I like to have the click aperture for photo. Most cine lenses obviously have a declick aperture, so it's something that you want to do. So the uh, rehousing will do that all for you, but you can do it manually. It's not a, that a, that difficult. Um, each ring costs around $30 USD, I believe. Uh, same with the adapters. There are two kind of adapters to adapting the um, Nikkor onto the EF mount. There is a PhotoJux that does it, which is uh, this one here. And then I have another sort, so they're like very simple um, adapters with no element in between. So it's very important not to choose uh, an adapter with a glass element in between because those usually will uh, have like a poor quality and then won't uh, they will like make your image soft and odd so I don't recommend those. So that's the PhotoDiox and here you have the KNF concept. So I got both because I found that uh, the um, PhotoDiox can is kind of loose uh, whereas the, um, the KNF is really stiff but the lens doesn't move on the mount when mounted on the on the camera. I found that it's uh, there is a bit more of like a movement onto the black magic and there is on the uh, the RF mounts so it's something to keep in mind so here if we take the uh, the black magic this is the 6k pro uh, which is ef mount um, so obviously i can i'm gonna use uh, the uh, nikor here uh, and i have one that's already mounted with an adapter yes so this is a uh, to give you an idea here is like it would technically be like a, a house made uh, rehouse of a nikor lenses to ef you have the focusing lenses, you maybe have your like a larger filter thread to be a, maybe a 77 or 82 or 95 or whatever what you wish. And in the back here, you would have the adapters to adapt to EF. Mount it here and then click. And there you have it. Then you have like this old, this is a 28 uh, 2.8, which uh, makes it around the, what, the 35, 36 onto the, uh, the Blackmagic because it's a Super 35 which is a great, um, I wouldn't call it the wide lenses, but uh, yeah, kind of wide. Um, great lenses, obviously there is no, it's not uh, stabilized, so you would need to make sure that um, yeah, the camera is steady because you'll have lots of that micro gear, right? But I mean, I shot a project uh, with uh, the Blackmagic and using those old lenses and the lens I used the most was that 28 and I just love um, the images it was able to produce.
But obviously, there is a couple of things to keep in mind when, uh, if you want to invest or use those lenses, is that uh, for for the most part, they're 50 years old or 60 years old or maybe a bit newer, but they're, they're older lenses with uh, older technology. And um, lens manufacturers have done tons of progress since. So don't go into the uh, legacy lens uh, market thinking it will be on the same quality as a modern lenses. Um, even those are all like very fast prime lenses that you can buy uh, for much cheaper than your modern counterpart. They'll be soft at wide open. It's something that needs to be to be known and that you need to remember is um, this, which one is it? This is the 51.2, for example, um, by Nikkor. It's like before the new mount with the Z mount. Uh, that was the only lens at 1.2 you can get from, from Nikon. They never made a... They never made a modern autofocus lens at f1.2. They had their Nikkor G lenses to the 1.4. So for the longest time, Canon had it for their um, for for the on the EF the 1.2. But that was the last uh, f 50 mm 1.2 before the Z mount. But at 1.2, it's very soft. It's it's not as sharp as a. It's not even as sharp as my uh, Nikkor as my Minolta 1.4 50 mm and it's only when stepping down to f 2.8 that uh, you will get like uh, very clean images and sharp. Um, but it's something that people tend to forget is that you wouldn't get those lenses to shoot at 1.2. You would get those lenses because if you compare a, if we compare this one to the, this one, for example, so this is the Nikkor 1.2, this is the Nikkor much smaller F2. Well, this lens at F2, because you're, it's already being stopped down, will have better result than this one at f2 which is the maximum quality so to have more to have like it's not a scientific a test or anything but if i step this one at f2.8 i'll have similar result than having this one at f2 for example so that's why one of the reason too when uh, it was not only for like low lights but you would get those very fast prime is because they would get better once you stop down and uh, you'll have better result than the the medium range f2 so it's not all about uh, shooting wide open, and certainly, certainly not with those old legacy lenses. The other thing too with those lenses is the uh, lens flare. Um, I only have uh, two lens hood for those lenses, the other ones weren't sold with it. Um, and most of those lenses you can either choose to put a, a filter on or uh, the lens hood, because the lens hood most of the time was just threaded. So I never use lens hood with those lenses. The Minolta are really known to have uh, very strong flares, for example. Um, this is partly due to their um, lens coating. And so, it's something again, something to keep in mind is um, for some projects, having those lens flares, lens flare, especially for filmmaking, can be an asset. But uh, having, let's say, lens flare into a, a studio environment might not be the thing that you want. Um, so you could obviously use a matte box to counter that, but keep in mind that there'll be more, uh, those old lenses will have uh, less of a control when it comes to lens flare than modern lenses. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, all of those lenses will have some stronger fringing, like purple fringe and um, green fringe when using on modern cameras, especially when you shoot, uh, use them at wide open. Uh, it's something to be expected too from those old lenses. They're not as uh, uh, well constructed as the, they don't have the new technology of the modern lenses. So it's something that you need to kind of uh, almost kind of embrace uh, that can be used for an advantage uh, for maybe creative projects. But uh, when it comes to, to fringing, you can remove some in post-production, let's say in Lightroom. One tip though is that if you're using those legacy lenses for photography with a modern camera and then you are editing your images into Lightroom, well, it turns out that most of um, those manual lenses, if they were like some of the latest generations of uh, manual lenses being made, they actually still have their profile available into Lightroom. So obviously, once you import the images into Lightroom, the Lightroom won't know that you shot these images on these particular lenses. But if you go in manually into the um, preferences for the lenses on Lightroom, there is a list coming out and then there is plenty of different manufacturers and you can set for um, each of those lenses. For example, I have a, a lens profile for like uh, that will remove the vignetting and um, some of the fringe for my Minoltas, but also for my Nikons. And then so what I made was a, a preset for each of those uh, lens corrections for each of those lenses. And then when I import those images, I can quickly just add these, um, those lens corrections. And uh, that really helps uh, 
getting uh, rid of that thick netting, especially when wide open. One of the questions that come back the most when it comes to adapting legacy lenses onto modern camera is, uh, will be some sort of autofocus? The answer is no, no, never. I mean, you cannot uh, make um, autofocus on those lenses. They're well, like fully manual. And uh, even when looking at uh, some of those adapters on Amazon and just looking randomly through the questions, the question that come back the most is, will this adapter uh, enable autofocus on the lens? And again, the answer is no, it's impossible. Um, when you buy those lenses, it's to uh, focus manually with them. You could technically uh, get the um, DJI uh, that does like the gimbal. They have this uh, LiDAR tool, which is uh, you bring it on top of the camera. You can have some sort of autofocus with, uh, with the lenses, but it's more of a solution for filmmaking. And each time you place a new lens, you have to fully recalibrate it. But something to keep in mind still, if you maybe want only a single legacy lenses for some effect, you can um, set it up with this LiDAR system and technically transform one of those old lenses into a autofocus enabled lens. So if you are using the Blackmagic for filmmaking or a camera with um, the EF mount for photo, like a 5D Mark IV, for example, then you can adapt the, uh, the Nikkor lenses on it, uh, no problem. However, if you're um, maybe thinking of getting the Minolta, well, don't, because the Minolta cannot be adapted onto the EF. It can only be adapted on modern uh, mirrorless cameras. So no problem using that onto uh, Sony, uh, Nikon, Fujifilm, Canon, and so on and so on. And then the adapter will be slightly different. This is really slim, like a pancake looking. But here is the adapter for um, adapting the Minolta lenses onto my, um, my R6 or my R5C. So it's much thicker, obviously, because it can compensate for where the mirror would be and the distance between the back of the sensor and the back of element of the lenses. So those are much thicker, but same. This one is a KNF as well, uh, very well built. Uh, this costs about $40 Canadian. Uh, you have the little push button here to be able to unlock the lens. So it's, it's, a, it's a ring of metal, so it's a pair of any electronics and it can be adapted onto the uh, R6 here. And then taking it here, we can adapt here, and there you are. So this is a much more compact um, setup. So great for travel. Uh, if you basically put the 28 on there or some sort of like 40 mil, you would basically have a lens, a uh, standard lens, so you can do basically everything with it. And the great thing if your mirrorless camera has an IBIS sensor is that uh, it will be very good to counter the fact that those lenses don't have um, IS image stabilization. So here the R6 is, is, has uh, IBIS, so I love using the R6 with those legacy lenses because uh, I can remove that micro jitter, uh, especially if I shoot the 105 or the uh, 80 to 200. I don't shoot this one much anymore because I have my uh, a new uh, EF uh, zoom lenses, but that prime 105, um, well, anything about 85, I would say it's great when the lens does have uh, image stabilizations. Um, and using those don't have it, but uh, it can be the same effect if you have the IBIS. So uh, that's a great little tool here. Um, you can get some great effect. I, would, I call them effects the wrong word, but you can get some great images and with the unique uh, characteristics because of those legacy lenses for your photography. Then you have the fact that those lenses are so small. I mean, look at the size of those. I mean, this, this you can almost Sorry for the noise, shuffle noise, but yeah, you can almost put it in there or put it into like your jacket pocket. Just grab one lens as a, a fast prime alongside your zoom lens and then you have a fast prime in your pocket instead of into a backpack. So as you can see, I really enjoy shooting legacy lenses, whether it's on my film cameras, on my uh, Blackmagic, my R5 CDR6, any type of camera. Um, I love sometimes just taking one lenses, let's say the uh, 28 here. I adapt, I adapt this on my uh, on my R6, and I just go for a walk uh, with a single lens. It's a manual focus lens, so you have to take more of time when like composing images. You have to zoom with your feet, um, and then yeah, it's it's a very it's a different type of photography for sure. Um, but I really enjoy it. Uh, it's a much uh, I would say peaceful way of taking images. Uh, obviously, you can do the same thing with. Um, with modern lenses, but there is something unique about using those old, like 50 years old lenses. Because um, when you think about those, I mean, these have, I think, have more value that, uh, that like, let's say those, uh, this EF, these are still a great lenses, but uh, the value of it is now 
it's, it, it feels really outdated because of uh, all of the people are comparing those to modern lenses, but very rarely they'll compare those to modern lenses, if, if I make any sense. Um, so I found the value of those uh, greater and still, still they're much cheaper to, to purchase than uh, buying modern lenses. Um, you can just see if uh, your local camera shop uh, has some. Um, sometimes the marketplace, uh, Facebook marketplace or whatever Craigslist or you have from your country, um, Le Bon Coin in France, <laughs> uh, or even the best way is to go through eBay. Uh, most of those lenses uh, come from Japan. There are so many resellers in Japan and they're uh, most of the time they'll clean the lenses uh, and, and I never had, a, I'll touch wood, but I never had a bad surprise by, all, by ordering by ordering a, a lenses from Japan or even my F3 for that matter. Um, they have so much more uh, choices than you would find in North America or in Europe even. Um, so eBay is a great way to start if you're looking for those lenses, I have a better idea of the price. Um, uh, often I'd say that eBay has the international price. Um, meaning um, this is the price that you should get the lenses for. Uh, you, you, they might be more expensive in some camera stores, but then you can, once if you're going to a camera store, you can actually inspect the lenses and then it might be a bit more expensive because the camera store is uh, getting a cut out of it, but you're helping the like, local camera store, so it's something as well that uh, you should do if you can. Here on the island, I have no, <laughs> no store for like uh, old lenses, so I can only order them from eBay. Uh, but even if I go on the mainland in Vancouver, there is a bow photo that has like a nice collection of, uh, of uh, legacy lenses. So regarding of, uh, depending of where you want to buy them, I would maybe start with one. Uh, don't, don't just go uh, berserk here and buy a full set because you might hate it. You might not like the fact that it's fully manual. You might not look uh, like the, the look of them. You might not like the fact that it's soft at wide open, all of those, those uh, pros and cons we've talked earlier. That it's going to be depending on uh, your own uh, your preferences, but maybe start with one. Um, you may have heard a lot about the Helios uh, 44, which is a 44-2, I believe it's called. It's a Russian lenses. It's a 58 1.4, and it has, like, it's very unique because of the swirly bokeh. A friend of mine has one. Um, I don't have one yet. Maybe I'll get one just, just to try it out. But just pick one lenses, uh, maybe... Uh, you pick your focal, your favorite focal lens. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's 28, uh, and then pick a, a, a brand that uh, you can adapt on your, on your current camera and try it out. See if you like it, and if you don't like it, you'll be able to resell it no problem. So something to keep in mind as well. And once again, just pick one lens, adapt it to your modern camera, one body, one lens. Just go for a walk, go for a trip, go for something, and just. To slow down the process, you'll see it's a much different approach to photography or even filming um, by using just uh, old legacy lenses, and then you'll be able to like really push that creativity because you have to move around the subject, you have to zoom with your feet, you have to get creative because you may not be able to get those far out subjects. You may need to like pull down, pull out to get a wider scene. Uh, it's just a very fun process to do in general. And yeah, I think that's it. I hope you enjoyed this uh, messy review of uh, how to adapt the legacy lens onto your modern camera. And if you like this video and got something out of it, please consider liking and subscribing so I can do more in the future. I'll see you next time.